Hello everybody, how's it going? So we're back. Um, this is going to be chapter uh, 5 of part 1. This is going to be the last chapter for part 1. And then we'll be moving on to uh, part 2. But we're going to take a short break in between parts 1 and 2. Although I don't think uh, that's advisable for me. Because part 2 is quite lengthy. Um, but uh, anyway, we, uh, I, I do feel like I have to you know, bring out content for... The other viewers who came here initially for um you know the original mtg gameplay cards card creation and tutorials but anyway here we are will frowned as he watched rowan her head bobbing with each step as she trampled down through the path through the woods her mouth was running the way it did when she was trying to impress their friend titus who was a year older and the best swordsman of the last 20 years, according to everyone in Castle Ardenvale. Will fell far enough behind that he caught only bits and pieces. Red caps, questing, embereth, sword training, more red caps, embereth again, and its famous tournament grounds where Rowan planned to compete as soon as she was allowed. Oko barely spoke at all and then usually had only follow-up questions to get Rowan going again. Maybe their new companion was just exceedingly polite, but since carefully squeezing people for knowledge was Will's preferred mode of operation, it made him suspicious to see someone else doing what looked exactly like that. Rowan was a perfect target. Abruptly, he realized he couldn't hear the hunter. He glanced back and almost jumped out of his skin from fright because the big man was right there, three paces behind. His ability to move silently was uncanny, weirdly. He seemed smaller now than he had in the woods. With an effort, Will settled his steps back into an even stride. My name's Will, he said with a friendly smile. My thanks for saving us. We owe you a debt. The man's gaze shifted to Will's face. A flicker of emotion narrowed his eyes, but he said nothing. Everything went by so fast up there. I didn't catch your name, Will added. The lines around the man's mouth tightened. He shifted his double-handed grip on his axe. Will eyed the path ahead, wondering if he'd have to dodge out of the way of an axe swinging. The man said in a soft growl, he calls me dog. I heard that, said Will, matching his softness. If you'd rather I call you something else, let me know. The man tilted his head to one side as if listening, then shrugged. Have you come far? Yes. Will wanted to ask more questions, but wasn't sure how to do it without seeming rude and nosy. Or without attracting Oko's attention. He contented himself with walking alongside the hunter. It was oddly calming to have someone so large and murderous on your side. After a while, as they strode along under the gently rustling leaves, he saw a deer grazing in the dim distance of the woods. As he often did when hunting or exploring with Rowan and their friends, he reached out to pat the man companionably on the forearm to alert him without speech. The man flinched away before Will could touch him hands tightening on his axe. No! Startled, Will took in a breath to control himself. Oko had ordered the hunter not to harm them, but even so, his heart seemed to be trying to squeeze up into his throat. He kept his pace steady and began to hum soothing tunes like The Brave Hunter of Silver Mountain and The Blooming Rose. After a bit, Seeing that Will meant to keep his distance, the man settled into a more relaxed walk, although Will remained an on edge. Something about the situation made his mind itch with discomfort. Ahead, Rowan was still talking. Now she was discussing Castle Lockwing as if she were an expert on it and its missing cauldron of eternity. She had always obsessed with how their parents had both been sent on the high quest by the questing beast after a two generation long interregnum when the five courts hadn't had a high king or high queen to rule over them. To Rowan, the goal and the glory mattered most. Will wanted to know the whys and what's of the world. Was this fellow Oko truly from Lochtwain? It could be. Queen Ayara was an elf, and she'd been ruling forever. 
some elves had remained at Loctwain rather than would draw with their brethren into the wilds after the elven courts had lost their hold on the realm. The hunter puzzled him too. His passive obedience bothered Will. It felt coerced. The man had also an indefinable air of strangeness that nagged at Will. That made him recall the ice mirror he'd felt impelled to create in the garden and the sights he'd seen as if through a window onto unknown lands. Why did the hunter remind him of places he wasn't sure existed except in his own mind? The slope leveled as they walked through coppiced woodland where people from Beckbarrow collected firewood and logs for fences and building. Will said, We're almost to town, so it's safe to put your axe away. Towns are safe, muttered the hunter. Will opened his mouth, closed it again, took in and released the breath, and finally spoke. We aren't going into town, just to the tourney field outside town. That's where the procession will make camp for the night. I'll be leaving you when we get there. I'm the High King's son, he didn't say. I'm with the baggage train. If you need anything, you can find me there. I won't forget what you did for my sister and me. No, said the hunter, and abruptly halted. Ahead, Oko stopped. Dog? Is there a problem? No towns. Ah, of course. This is such a placid, peaceful, orderly land, I had forgotten how the fleas of civilization scratch at you, my loyal hound. You wait in the woods, where you are comfortable. I'll call for you should I need you. The hunter faded into the trees. Elko gestured to Rowan to allow her to lead the way. Not that she wasn't already leading the way. Will observed with a roll of the eyes as he fell into step behind the two of them. I do hope my companion will be safe, Oko murmured in his silken voice. Those red caps make me fear Ardenvale is not so peaceful and orderly as I have been told it is. The realm is far more peaceful and orderly now that father... I mean, now that the High King rules. I'm not old enough to remember the olden days. When there was a lot more trouble, what sort of trouble? Unsavory magic let loose unchecked ogres and dragons rampaging and destroying as they pleased, because no two towns would agree on a joint effort to defend them off, witches roaming wherever they wished and cursing people with evil gifts and terrible afflictions. Old people in the villages sometimes claim that long ago, there used to be a midwinter hunt that always ended with a blood sacrifice because blood spilt at the midwinter solstice in the wilds is said to fend off death itself. Do you know anything about that? I do not, but it certainly sounds ominous. If you are the one being hunted, I mean. No one should feed off the life of another. That's what my mother always says. A difficult position to argue against. She says we are obligated to help others even if it doesn't seem to benefit us directly. Because the realm will be at peace only when everyone's life is at peace. The courts used to squabble all the time but now they cooperate because there is a single ruler to coordinate and administrate and to make sure everything is fair and just. Don't you think so? They always intend to better the lives of all. They they not. That's what their rules are for. I guess not everyone in the realm would necessarily agree. Queen Ayara is so old and has been around for so long, she might not like being told what to do. But you would know better what people say in Loch Twain. King Yorvo too. He's so old his father was king in Garenbrig when the humans drove the elves out of the realm. No offense to you, Oko. No offense taken. I hold no grudge against actions taken long before I set foot on this land. You're from Loch Twain, and you don't hold a grudge? You'd be the first. Rowan laughed. Will said under his breath. Ro, I said I hold no grudge on this particular point. I did not say I hold no grudges. I... Do apologize, said Rowan in her usual lightning swift manner, 
casting Will a narrow-eyed look to let him know she'd heard his whispered rejoinder. That was rude of me, Oko. I'm sorry for it. You're very kind and, of course, forgiven, said Oko so graciously that Will could not help but admire his easy ability to accommodate Rowan's thoughtlessness. Have you met King Orvo of Garenbrig? I have not. Thus, he launched Rowan onto Garenbrig's court and history. Will slowed his pace, content to enjoy the beautiful landscape and its respite from the dangers they left on Chokendrum. The ridge was forbidding ground to anyone not of age to quest, and of course, they had disobeyed their mother's direct order. But when he searched his own heart, he found he didn't regret their adventure. He and Ro had worked well together. Fortune had favored them with the intervention of the strangers. Now he had a mystery to gnaw at. Was the hunter an unwilling servant or a willing companion? Surely his name wasn't really Dog. Was he originally from the wilds? Somehow tamed? Or had he grown up in the realm? Woodland gave way to fields and orchards. They reached the main road in the tourney field. The wide expanse was ringed with a double palisade, one marking off the lists and a second for the larger area reserved for spectators and campsites. Locals had arrived in advance of their grand procession with carts and barrows laden with food to sell. Enterprising folk were cooking sausages, roasting turnips, and stirring spelt porridge. In the distance, a haze of dust marked the approach of a high king and his entourage. They'd made it in time. Will caught up with the others and gave Oko his other smile, the one tinged with a hint of the knowledge that, even though his mother held strictly to the idea that you did not throw around the weight of your position, he knew exactly what his was. Apologies, Lord Oko. Rowan and I have to get back to our duties. We can't thank you enough. If you or your companion need anything, please find us. Oko's smile held an eerie glamour, his gaze fixed first on Rowan, and then on Will, drawing them closer as if by force of will. No need to thank me, my friends. Really, you need not think about our meeting at all now we're parting ways. You have duties and obligations, and I have my own quest to attend to. I've learned so much from you that makes my task here all so much clearer to me now. My thanks. What quest is that? Rowan asked brightly, leaning toward the elf. Nothing you need concern yourself with. Entirely forgettable. Oko wiped his sweating brow. Will hooked fingers around Rowan's elbow and dug in near the gash. We really do have to go. I hope we meet again. As she winced, he guided her away. Out! What's wrong with you? She asked shaking off his hand. It's not like you to be dazzled by a pretty face, Ro. No way. It's completely like you. Are you jealous he paid more attention to me than you? I don't like the way he calls that man dog. That's no way to treat a person. Maybe it's a joke between them, Rowan muttered sullenly as she looked back. They'd gotten far enough away by now that Will couldn't see the elf amid the crowd come to greet the High King. Much of Beckborough's population had turned out to line the roads. Cheers rose as the procession's banners floated into view, bright and colorful and stirring. With the moment upon them, Rowan became all business, keeping her head down behind the crowds as the vanguard passed. The High King rode at the front escorted by knights from each court as well as his longtime boon companion, Cado, who had ridden with him through thick and thin. A modest gold circlet crowned his head, hard to see against his golden blonde hair, and nothing as fancy as the elaborate diadem seen in the portraits of high rulers of days gone by. His gelding was more splendidly adorned than he was, caparisoned in embroidered white and gold cloth while Alginus Kenrith's own riding tabard matched that of his attendants. The High King wore a sturdy leather sheath and plain hilted sword. Once he achieved the high rulership, he'd hung up the gilded sword gifted to him by the questing beast and settled to the less glamorous but more difficult task of ruling well. More than anything, 
he looked as absolutely delighted to be greeted by the citizens of Beckborough as they were to be greeting their beloved High King. He was always smiling, Will was sure of it. In all these years, he'd never figured out his father. Did he love the praise and the cheering so much he couldn't get enough of it? Was he simply genuinely eager to serve the realm with all his loyalty, knowledge, persistence, courage, and strength? He wasn't a particularly inquisitive or deep-thinking man. He left that to their mother. But he was so honorable and courteous and gallant that he was impossible to hate. Well, the denizens of the wilds hated him, since the High King's entire purpose for existing was to keep the wilds in check by expanding the orderly peace of the realm. Even as a young man questing in the hope of proving himself worthy to sit on the high throne, Aginus Kenrith had come in for assault of hate. Will didn't dwell on it, but he never forgot that he and Rowan's birth mother had been murdered in the wild soon after they'd been born. Hey, keep your head down! Rowan yanked him back into the crowd. They kept moving against the flow of people who were walking alongside the procession toward town. There's Titus! It was impossible to miss Titus's blazing red hair and pale, freckled face. Their friend rode toward the back with the younger knights and the hopeful knight candidates still making a name for themselves. Cerise had shaken off the other healers, the old windbags as she called them. She and her unicorn, Sophos, had managed to creep into the ranks beside Titus. Will felt a familiar ache seeing his friends riding together. It had been so much easier to be companions when they were younger, not to wrestle with the complicated, intense feelings each friend raised in him now. Accomplished, attractive Titus, and brilliant, beautiful Ceres. Will, there's a ponies! Trust Rowan never to let inconvenient doubts interfere with a galloping charge toward her intended goal. The crowd was breaking up now that the High King had passed. They slipped in among the passing wagons, and just like that, they were walking with their ponies as if they'd been with the procession the whole way. If the drivers around them noticed, no one said a word. Why would anyone say a word? It was all very well for their mother to demand they act like everyone else, taking training and doing chores along with all the other youths in the castle. But Will knew perfectly well they weren't treated like everyone else. No one would ask them where they had gone and why they had only returned just now. If the queen didn't want to see, it was only because she refused to see. The baggage wagons trundled up to the tourney field at last. Will worked alongside Rowan to set up traveling tents for the night. She was better at pounding in stakes. He liked to string ropes in decorative patterns, whose tensile strength also held exceptionally well if the wind picked up, as it often did at dusk. Or if a chance met flock of mischievous wind spirits decided to trouble the night camp. On more casual journeys around Ardenvale, the High King would have joined in with the setup, working alongside the others. But this time, the man who sat atop the High Throne must meet formally with the representatives of each town or region where the procession halted. The Grand Procession was an annual reminder of his overlordship. Once the encampment was set up, they waited their turn to get their share of the evening's supper. Cold venison pie from the castle ovens, bread and cheese, and honey oat cakes as they settled down beside an isolated campfire on the edge of the field. Titus and Cerise appeared with their own trenchers. Cerise carried a bowl of fresh berries bathed in warm cream. I win the forage tournament yet again, she said, brandishing the bowl. Titus grinned at Will, who blushed. But the young knight sat down beside Rowan. I smell something rotten, Siri said, handling the bowl to Will before crouching beside Rowan. Her sensitive healer's nose led her straight to the wound. When she peeled back the fabric, Rowan set her teeth as Siri probed the gash. That smells like pus flower, and this looks like a blade cut. The only time I ever heard of pus flower juice smeared on blades is when red caps do it to poison their prey, if they don't kill them outright. Her eyes could melt you, or slay you, Will reflected as she was in slaying mode right now. Between bites of bread, Titus remarked, 
I rode up and down the line during the day. I saw your ponies, but I never saw you two. Ro, demanded Therese, this will go rotten, and you'll be too sick to walk by the end of the week. But I won't heal you until you tell me the truth. Rowan cast a desperate glance at her twin. He spooned a bite of delicious berries and cream into his mouth, meeting her gaze as he chewed and swallowed with relish. It's alright, Will, Cerise added. Whatever happened, we know it was Rowan's idea. Alright, alright, said Rowan. We missed the departure, so we crossed over Choking Drum to get here before you. Choking Drum? cried Titus. Lost the wilds. You're not old enough. Never mind that, said Cerise. You didn't find Will in time, did you? The Queen must have forbidden you from coming because you were late. How'd you get out? Rowan sighed. She was called away. She won't be back until tomorrow or later. Cerise rolled her eyes. You have all the luck. There are still red cops on Choking Drum. Titus looked up at the ridge line beyond. Distinguishable as a dark mass like a sleeping beast, stars shone above the hill. A few clouds spun fine like fraying cloth against the realm of the high heavens. Did you report it? Shame struck Will like a spear. What if Redcaps attacked Wildrum again? No. Titus jumped up, outraged. You're not responsible enough to quest yet. You do know that, do you, Rowan? Rowan? She cried. What about Will? The young knight didn't even look toward Will. I expected better of you, Rowan. You should expect better of yourself. I have to report it. Rowan squeaked in protest, but as she attempted to leap up, Cerise clamped a hand over her arm to hold her down. Titus strode off, ever dutiful. Will mopped his forehead with the back of a hand. Now they were in for it. He shoveled another soothing spoonful of berries and cream into his suddenly dry mouth. Sit quietly while I heal this, hissed Cerise. Because if you don't, You'll not enjoy how it eats you out from the inside when it putrefies and fills you up with nasty green pus. She bent over Rowan's arm, hands emanating a pale mist. Rowan gave a pained grunt before shutting her eyes and gritting her teeth. A buzz of noise caught Will's attention. A jovial group of travelers moved their way, pausing at each fire to speak to those gathered there. The High King was making his rounds, accompanied by a steward, a clerk in Caddo was still in armor. What's this mishap? The king called cheerfully as he strolled up to their campfire. Few things escaped his observant eye. His gaze lit on Rowan's torn sleeve and bloodied arm. Rowan stared up at her father like a rabbit caught in a trap as the fox approaches. Ceri still had her head down, murmuring the sealing wounds of her spell. Most likely she was staying out of it, which was fair enough. Will could not lie to his father. He gripped the bowl with white-knuckled fingers and wished he was back on choking drums surrounded by howling redcaps. Titus appeared out of the gloom. Is that scratch sorted out yet, Cerise? He said, then gave a pretended start of surprise. Your Highness, my apologies. We were out horsing around and things got out of hand. Nah. Well, the young have an energy we older folk lack at the end of a long day's march. I myself seek only a chair to sit in and a large slice of venison pie to shore up my flagging limbs. I hope you have received the same. The High King gave each of them an amiable nod as he indicated their trenchers. He by no means betrayed to the council members that Rowan and Will were his children since he would never go against Queen Linden's directive. Cato gave Will and then Rowan a wink and somehow there came a mirror flash like reflected light that made Will blink repeatedly as if chaff had gotten into his eyes. Kenrith and his retinue strode off to the next campfire. Will exhaled. I thought we were in for it. You didn't rat on us, said Rowan to Titus, running her fingers over the healed cut. Titus crossed his arms on his broad chest. You must know, I never rat. 
A informed steward in arena, a local, told me of a sighting. She'll see a patrol of responsible knights is sent out. Roland glared at the sky, but could not retort. Cerise settled her slain gaze on Will. Did you really just eat all the berries and cream? He looked down to discover that indeed, in his fit of nervousness, he had. But Cerise only laughed because she was the most wonderful person in all the realm. Titus looked from his trencher. How many red cups were there? Six or seven? Rowan spoke with more hesitation than usual. You fought all of them off? Just the two of you. Rowan pressed her hands against her eyes. Will too felt a headache coming on. A sickly memory of vines turning into snakes to devour dead redcaps slithered through his mind. And then he was reminded of Cado's glittering wink. The rest of the memory went dark. All he could recall was trees rustling with an unseen threat creeping closer. He wiped damp plums on his leggings and began humming the tune to The Brave Hunter of Silver Mountain. I'm impressed, said Titus. Seven red cops. It was nothing Will and I couldn't handle, proclaimed Rowan with a proud lift of her chin. All's well, no harm done. All hail scamps. I hope you had an uneventful first day's journey. Cato strolled up with a genial smile. His short black hair was mused, and he was no longer wearing armor. Just his tabard. He held a curry comb. I'm looking for the High King. Have you seen him? Will exchanged a puzzled glance with Rowan. You'd better know than us. How's that? Rowan grinned. I see the riddle you're setting us. We just saw you with him. Cato shook his head good-naturedly. You two jokesters. I've caught you out this time. I wasn't with him. You winked at us, said Will, but he broke off and grasped Rowan's wrist. The wink. Do you recall the wink? She pressed a hand to her forehead, wincing. No. Cato rocked back as if he'd been struck. I wasn't with him. I just now finished tending to the horse and pack as I always do when he has duties that prevent him from doing it himself. The knight kept his black hair cut short ever since the day an angry Undyne had reached out of a still lake, caught him by his long glorious locks and slashed him across his right eye. Your scar! Will desperately tried to gouge the memory back to the surface, but it fought like an eel that kept slithering out of his grasp. Cerise! Titus, do you recall? He winked at us, but he had no scar. They all looked out into the darkness, as the scatter of fires in the shadow of tall trees, a sharp scream rose out of the night, then cut off. Cato drew his sword. Which way did they go?